Lord, we thank you. 
So to start off, we want to thank everybody who came out and participated in our trunk or treat last night. We had a great turnout. We want to thank you for bringing any chili that you might have brought, or for decorating your trunk, and just giving back to the kids. On Friday, November 1st at 7 p.m., we're going to be having the youth of Kentucky are going to be having an Impact Student Ministries Night. So they'll be here at the church at 7 o'clock. So if you have youth that want to come, bring them by. We're just going to have a time of worship and just fellowshipping together. And then on the following day at 10 a.m., we're going to be hosting the Girl Talk for the district. So it's $10 for every girl who's in middle school, high school, or an adult woman who wants to come. It's going to be here in the annex, and it's just a great time for all the girls in the district. Uh, daylight savings time uh, ends on Sunday, so on, no on November 3rd, so don't forget to set your clocks back an hour. And we do have Sunday evening prayer time tonight at 5 p.m. So as we go into our time of giving, I'm going to read something from Acts chapter 10, verse 30 to 31. And it says, For days ago I was praying in my house about, about the same time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. These verses show us that Cornelius was a faithful man of God, that his prayers were answered and his giving to the poor were noticed. When we are giving back to God, it captures his attention. And just like Cornelius, our prayers can also be answered when we are giving. There are multiple ways that you can give this morning. You can mail it into 130 Depot Street. We have the drop box back in the back of the sanctuary as well as downstairs. You can also give on Tidely. Now if you bow your head and close your eyes, I'll go ahead and pray this morning. Dear Lord, we just thank you that you have brought us all here today. I thank you that you have given to us that we might be able to give back to you and give back to the church to grow your community and grow the family of Christ. And it's your name we pray. Yeah. 
John chapter 4, beginning with verse 34. We'll preach for a few moments on the subject of finish his work. Look at your neighbor and say, finish his work. John chapter 4, verses 34 through 42. We've been in the book of John now for several weeks. I hope that you are harvesting and gleaning from uh, this powerful gospel. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Can you help me say that? To finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. Say that with me. Lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for the harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. And many, say many, many, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Say believed in him. Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Help me with that. Many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Last week we began talking about this woman at the well, this uh, at the well at Sychar. And when I began to look at it again this week, I began to look at it and think, you know, sometimes we wake up and we just have what we call an ordinary day. We get up and we go about our business, we go to work, we uh, try to accomplish the things that your list maker that are on the list, and uh, sometimes we, uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know about you, but I kind of like regular days, I like the consistency of that, but yet, if that was all life was about, how boring would that be, amen? And this woman goes to the well, it's just like any other day. She goes to uh, get some water so that uh, she can make it through the day, and she goes at noontime to avoid the looks because the people knew about her life. It was really the women who would go to the well, and so she didn't want to hear the whispers. She didn't want to hear the, uh, the talk about how many husbands she's had and, and, and the uh, lifestyle that she lives. And yet she comes to the well, and... She meets Jesus. And I love this because Jesus came to her. She didn't go to him. And, and I think, I, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad the day that Jesus came to me. I didn't really find him. He found me. He knew right where I was, right what I was going through. And, and can I tell you that a day where we encounter Jesus is never a regular day. Can I get some help this morning? Uh, you see, it's, it's never a regular day when we encounter and we meet with Jesus because he is a, a, a God who changes things and moves in situations and blesses and, and pours out of his spirit. And so any day uh, this morning, I hope that you have encountered Jesus through the worship and I, I believe that you're going to encounter him through the word. And so look at your neighbor and say, it's not a regular day because we come to encounter Jesus. So this woman, as she uh, comes to the well, and, and she, Jesus comes to her, and he begins to ask her for a drink of water. And, and I love the way uh, it, it states it. it tells, he tells her, if you only knew, if you only knew what I could give you, then you would be, can I just paraphrase, excited about me being here. Because he's offering her something that she's never tasted before. He is offering her a drink of living water. This morning, did you come thirsty for the Lord? 
Did you come with an attitude of there is a gift that God has come to bring to me today? Uh, this uh, everlasting life, but not only that, but even after we have been saved, that the Lord comes to give to us. He comes to uh, uh, bring his Holy Spirit into our life and to make these life changes and these transformations. So today there is a gift from the Lord. We see that she comes to the well and she encounters Jesus and he tells her about her life. He tells her about the five men that she's been married to and the one that she's living with. And he does it in such a way that uh, it is very powerful to her. And it's significant to the text. We didn't talk about this last week. It's significant to the text because the Jews believed that when the Messiah came, he could reveal secrets. Secrets in people's hearts and lives. How many knows that the Lord knows all about us? Amen. He, he knows uh, your thoughts. He understands. Uh, it it kind of disturbs me a little bit that the Lord knows everything that I even think. Because sometimes I'm like, ooh, can you get that thought out of there, right? Uh, and, and so we see that he would have been one who could know the heart and the secrets of people. And that's why she came to the conclusion at the end of this that he must be the Christ. He must be the Messiah. And so she's being uh, introduced to, to Jesus now as the Messiah. The one who came to make a difference in, for the Jews and for the world. We see that because of her testimony, people began to believe upon her, upon him, because of her. A man who told me everything about me. But yet she's so impressed by his love for her that she is confronted by her sin, but yet she feels safe and secure in his presence. I wonder, can we make a same self, uh, a same safe place for people? Can we make a safe place? How many of us would be judgmental if somebody come to you and said, I've got this sin in my life. I've never turned it over to God. But would, would there be a safe place with us, a place that uh, they could express their sin, a place that they could repent, a place that they could put their trust in Jesus. And, and I looked at that and I thought, we need to have that individually, but church, we need to have it as a church. Yeah. I, I expressed to you uh, last week that there's going to be people coming who will be different than you. And if we approach them with an attitude of judgment, uh, we approach them with the attitude where we're uh, uh, causing them to feel like they're being judged and they won't feel safe. I don't know about you, but I needed a safe place to repent. I needed that in my life. And so when people come, we cannot be judgmental. There's going to be some different people. I'm just, I'm just proclaiming that. I'm professing that. that there's going to be some different people that are going to come through our doors and we got to love them like Jesus. Yeah. Does that mean we turn a blind eye to every sin? No, we don't. But we lovingly confront sin and we bring them to Jesus. That's what we're uh, all about here. We're all about bringing people to Jesus. And many people believed on Jesus because of this woman's testimony. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Uh, a man who knows my past and a man who really knows me. A man who knows about my failures and my inconsistencies, yet he still loves me. Yeah. I love the old song that tells us that he knew me, yet he loved me. This king of glory, he, he knows us. He knows what it's even like to be a man. Uh, but yet he still loves us. All the failures, all the sins, all the things that we've done in our life, the things that we like to hide, the things that we don't want anybody to know about. Yet he knows us, but yet he still loves us. Fully known, yet fully loved. He's so powerful. His love for us. This woman 
is encountered by this love and she begins to tell people, come see this man. And I'm not sure why her testimony had such credibility with the people because of her past, but maybe it was the enthusiasm. Maybe they could notice a change in her life. I mean, there ought to be a change in our life when we've encountered Jesus, amen? We cannot no longer be the same. I'm so glad that my past is in the past. Can you get an amen this morning? Aren't you glad that your past is in the past? People might try to bring up your past, or even in your mind you may remember your past, or the devil may uh, try to remind you of your past, but I'm glad the past is in the past. I'm glad that I'm living for today and headed for a future. I'm glad that uh, I might not be quite where I'm going, but I'm not where I used to be. Can I uh, get a witness this morning? Uh, I'm so glad uh, that many, it says, many believed in him because of her testimony, despite the past, despite the wickedness, despite the sin in her life, despite the wayward relationships that she had had, many believed on him because she had been changed. Can I tell you that great things can come from your testimony? Many, say many. Many believed in him. So powerful. Many. Are we affecting the many? Are we affecting the people in our lives? Are they seeing our testimony? Are they seeing the change in our life? Many believe in him because of her words. What are you speaking? Are you speaking life? Are you speaking death? Are you speaking about Jesus? Are you telling people? Are they noticing that you have changed? What is your testimony speaking of? And they believed because of her testimony. Yes. <clears throat> so we see the example. But now they have come to Jesus. They left their work. They left the things that they were doing. They come to Jesus. And the Bible said, tells us that many more believed because of his word. Because of his Testimony, if you will. See, it's powerful. I mean, we should never forget this. Our testimony is powerful. Yet, when we bring people to Jesus, and that's what this woman did, and they hear his words, it's not just many. Somebody say more. Many more. Isn't that the goal? That many more believe in him? John wrote the whole gospel so that we may believe yes. in him and that we may have everlasting life. <laughs> and so whenever uh, we begin to give our testimony, when we begin to talk about who Jesus is to us, and we get people and we take them to Jesus. One of the, uh, the things that we say here, and it's on the back of your bulletin, is that one of the first goals that we have is to introduce people to Jesus. So that many more can believe. It's multiplied when they get into his presence. When they hear his word. There's something about being in God's presence. Can I get an amen this morning? We need to be in his presence more. We need to hear his word more, not less. We need to... Uh, 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 Take advantage of the opportunities that we have to worship the Lord, even outside of the church house. You ought to be listening to worship music. You ought to be praising the Lord. You ought to be hearing his word as you read your Bible. And by the way, read it out loud. Pastor, that's weird. No, it's not. Faith cometh by. Say it again. Faith cometh by. Hearing. I don't know about you, but I don't hear when I read silently. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Many more. Say more. more. Now say many more. Many more. many more believed because of his own word. And there was revival. We talk about revival a lot, especially in Pentecostal realms. We really do. But we have the wrong in the wrong context sometimes. 
I appreciate the worship that was tremendous today. I, I love those songs that I was able to worship a great, big, powerful God. Uh, and, and so that, that's, that's a wonderful part. But, but word, uh, revival is not just singing. Revival is not just a group of meetings. Revival is based upon our testimony as we uh, witness to people and they see the change in our life and then based upon the word of God. Revival comes from the word of our testimony and the word of God. It's power. We want to see revival in this place. Amen. We want to see people come to know the Lord. We want to see uh, all of these seats filled. We want to see God moving. Uh, I believe that revival uh, uh, will happen as we begin uh, to give our testimony. Testimony is powerful, but it does nothing if you keep it inside. Let me challenge you this morning. Give your testimony. Don't bottle it up. Don't keep it inside. Don't be bashful, if you will. I know we have different personalities, but don't be bashful with your testimony. You don't have to be loud like I am to give a testimony. Matter of fact, I'm not this loud outside of this context. Hardly ever do I raise my voice. But we need to give our testimony. It's powerful when we give it. It brings people to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. How many feel this this morning? Amen. Are you encouraged to give your testimony? Now look at this. If you're following along in your notes, and you're taking notes, you'll notice that I've come backwards to the text. And now we look at this text that Jesus, we finished with last week, and Jesus says, my food is to do, do the will of him who sent me. We talked all about that. There is a work that God has for us to do. How many believe that? Uh, and, and, but he says, it's not only to do his work, but to finish his work. We need to have an attitude of finishing. Amen? Not just starting, but completing. We need to have an attitude that that says I'm going to complete what God has called me to, if you will, a sense of urgency. Because what the disciples could not see is that there were people coming from this woman's testimony, and they were coming over the uh, from the city out to the well, and they were coming to see Jesus. And he's telling them, I come to finish God's work. I come to finish my Father's work. And what Jesus is telling the disciples as we look at the next thing is that there's an urgency. There's a demand upon us to do what God has called us to do. To finish. I ran one season of cross country when I was in high school. Becky's here. We had our 40-year class reunion. I know she don't look that old. I don't feel like I do, but we just had it, right? So I ran one season of cross country, and I hated it. <laughs> I don't feel like I was designed to run long distance. I like the sprint. I like to run and jump. I like to do all those kinds of things. But I hated running the distance. But can I tell you, when you get out in the middle of the course, you better have a mind that says, I'm going to finish this race. Because if you don't, cross country is different than track, folks. I've at times felt like I was so far behind everybody else that I was almost lost. Almost. I would never be last because I was always second to last. <laughs> That's just because my heart wouldn't let me be last. <laughs> but you've got to have a mind made up that you're going to finish what God has called you to do. And, and can I tell you something else? And I'm just going off script. It is not all about work. But if Jesus said, I come to finish the work. But it's not all toil and labor and struggle when we do what God calls us to do. Because Jesus said, there is a harvest. Thank God for the harvest. I believe that the harvest is white. I believe that the harvest is ready. And that's why Jesus is saying that there's an urgency to go get the harvest. 
Have you ever planted a garden? Have you ever uh, raised a garden? I help my dad do that a lot. And can I tell you, when the beans are ready to be picked, you got to pick the beans or they'll rot on the vine. The tomatoes will rot on the vine. The cucumbers will get too big and they'll get yellow and bitter. All those kinds of things. We understand that the harvest has to be harvested when it's time. There's an urgency. Now, when you go back to the text and you look at it, you're going to see that the timeline is that it's winter. What do you mean it's winter? It's winter. It's the season where they've just put the seed into the ground. And the rainy season, if you know Israel, is on the earth. <coughs> and so in the natural, thank you, Holy Spirit. In the natural, there was no harvest that could be seen. But yet in the spirit realm. Come on. In the spirit realm, there were lives that were about to be changed. Their destinies were about to be moved and rocked. Their world was going to be rocked. These people that were coming over the hillside out to the well, their lives were going to be drastically changed. Uh, there was going to be a difference in them. And Jesus is saying, don't look at the outside. Don't look at the natural, but understand that there are a people. Can I tell you something? I believe that we live in a desperate time. I believe it's chaotic and it's crazy. And the world is even saying something has to change. Well, the change has got to come through God's people who understand that we are living in a time of harvest. We are living in a supernatural time of God's harvest. Are we doing what God's called us to do? Are we seeing what God's called us to see? Look at your neighbor and say, finish his work. Finish his work. Finish it. Be about it. Can you look at your neighbor and say, get with it. Get, get, get with it. Go ahead and and do what God has called you to do. Jesus says, open your eyes. I love the New Living Translation that says, wake up and look around. Hmm. I wonder, do we sometimes sleep in the spirit? Do we fall off into a daze? Do we daydream? When God is saying, it's rainy, go get it. Go do what I've called you to do. Wake up and look around. See that there is a harvest, and it's a supernatural harvest of souls. It's people that are primed and ready. The very same people who, who see that the world is chaotic and they don't know what to do, you have the answer for them. Tell them. About Jesus. It's that simple. Let their appetite be. Be the salt. Be the salt. Yeah. Have you ever been to the ocean? You ever played in the waves? And if you get knocked down, you'll get a big mouthful of salt water. And you can't drink more salt water to get rid of your thirst. Yeah. It's the exact opposite. The more salt water you drink, the thirsty you will get. And the word of the Bible says that we're the salt of the earth. So people need to understand as you tell them about Jesus that he's offering this same living water, wells of water that will spring forth from us is what he says. And wells of water that will not only cleanse us but satisfy our spiritual man and, and, and bring us to the point. You see, it's all about what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. Jesus stood up uh, in, in the time of the uh, feast and he said, let any man who thirsts come to me and I will give unto him water, wells of living water. Are we making the world thirsty? What do you see when you go outside of this church? Do you see thirsty people? They need the Lord. They need Jesus. They need to know about him. You see, we are living in a season, I believe, that is the greatest opportunity that the church has ever had to gather in the harvest of the ages. 
Jesus said, don't say four more months. Don't just say it. There's four more months. And then the harvest. What we don't, didn't, don't understand sometimes is that that was a proverb. <laughs> it was a proverb that basically said, take your time. Seeds in the ground, it's going to be four more months. You can rest. But Jesus said, no, it's now. <laughs> My mind goes crazy places. You ever watch Lion King? And you see the Hakuna Matata. For all the rest of your days. Right? In other words, it's an attitude of, it doesn't matter. Sit back and relax. It'll take care of itself. That's not what Jesus said. He said, the harvest is ready. Go and get it. This thing. Go after it. Just by raising your hands. How many have people in their lives that need the Lord? How many have people that are a part of this great harvest? Do you believe that they're coming in? Because the other part of this is that not only do we do what God's called us to do and we witness to people, but then we have an expectation that people are going to get saved. I believe it. Huh. I believe that. I believe my family, all of my family, is going to come to know the Lord. Can you raise your hands and just profess that today? I believe that my family is coming to the Lord. Uh, you, you see, the devil doesn't like when we say that because it puts us in an atmosphere of expectation, i.e. faith. Faith. I believe not only my family, but all of my loved ones are coming to the Lord. I believe we're going to see a house full of people in this house, this church. Amen? I believe the Lord's growing us, bringing us into this season of harvest. Do you see it? Open your eyes. Wake up and look around, as the New Living Translation says. Are we busy about what doing, doing what God's called us to do? Are we ready? How many have loved ones that that you believe you could make an impact on if they would just hear you. How does it happen? Because we can try and try and try. How many have witnessed to your friends, your neighbors, and it seems to have no effect? It seems to have none. But what we don't know is the Holy Spirit, because we are have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, is planting seed and planting seed and planting seed and planting seed. And when you plant and plant and plant and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of that seed that is in someone's life, then it begins to germinate. And within a period of time, that seed begins to come up and spring forth. They will. Here's the problem. We plant some seed and then we doubt. When we dig them, that's essentially the same thing as digging up the seed. Don't dig it up. Keep praying. Keep believing. And when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, our testimony is not the testimony of a regular man or woman. It is a testimony of a spirit-filled man or woman or child of God. And it has to work. It's a spiritual law. Just like it's a physical law. When you plant seed and it gets watered, it comes forth. So when I say, do you believe that your loved ones are coming to the Lord? You can say, yes, Pastor. I believe it. Because I did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And God anointed me. And it's been watered by other people. And there's a harvest that is on the way. Do you believe it? Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, open up your eyes. The harvest is ready.